Ritesh Salwar to start the meeting. Over to you, Ritesh. Thank you, Ketan. Jai Jinendra, everyone, and welcome to September meeting. Hope you all are safe, good in health, and you know, kind of used to with this pandemic and going through this difficult time, but you know, feeling well. Uh, before we begin this meeting, I just want to you know jot down the agenda. Uh, first, we'll begin with now Karmandra and Stavan, just like you know, in every meeting. So today we have uh, Dr. Indu Varya and Dr. Mahesh Varya are going to lead that for us. Then we'll have kids presentation. This is something unique we are going to do today. And this is about recent project they have done. So I'll leave up to kids and teachers to talk more about it. Uh, then we have special session from our youth speaker, Hitali Ludaya. She's going to talk about very difficult topic that is anti-racism. So I'm excited to you know hear that from her. And after that, I'll have a few important announcements to make. And then finally, we have something special for our Sagram Sutra. So with that, without taking much time, uh, let me hand over to Varya family. Over to you, Mahesh Bhai. <coughs> uh, thank you. Uh, Jai Jinendra, everyone. Jai Jinendra, Sada. And my request is Mangal Bhavna, that we are doing a webex to do a webex. At the same time, we are going to be in the same way, we are going to be in the same way. If you join us uh, while we are reciting the servants, it would be wonderful. Om Namo Vajayanam Namo Loye Savasahunam Eso Pancha Namo Karu Savva Bhava Panasaram Mangananam Cha Padamam Havai Mangalam Padamam Havai Mangalam Chattari Mri Mangalam Chattari Mangalam Hari Anta Mangalam Sita Mangalam Sahu Mangalam Kevali Panato Damo Mangalam Chattari Loguttama Arihanta Loguttama Siddha Loguttama Tahu Loguttama Kevali Panato Damo Loguttama Chattari Charnam Pavachami Arihante Sharnam Pavachami Siddhe Sharnam Pavachami Sahu Sharnam Pavachami Kevali Panato Namo Sharnam Pavachami Om Shanti 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 He Ave Apre Bhopunya Kera Punjati, a Shimadnu Stavan Visakari Eche. Anipela Nokar Mantra no Mahima, Samara Mantra Parapre Pilati Arikari Eche. Samara Mantra Padona Vakari Sangha, 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 Sangha,
હવે એક આવે છે જે શ્રી વેદ પ્રાર્થના આપણે આપણી જૈન સ્તવન બુકમાં હોય છે જ અને જે લોકોને મોઢે યાદ હોય સાથે જોઈન કરી શકે છે મહાવીર પ્રભુ કે ચરણો મે શ્રદ્ધા કે કુસુમ ચદાય હમ ઉનકે આશો હવે આપણે જે સ્તવન લે છે એ મૈત્રી ભાવના નું છે મૈત્રી ભાવ નું પવિત્ર ચરણ મુજયાવના નિત્ય રહે 
विचार कर मैत्री भाव गुरुओ आदर भाव अपने करुणा भाव क्षमता भाव आ चार भावनी बात करी से मैत्री भाव आदर भाव करुणा भाव क्षमता भाव ये अपना जिंदगी में आप कई रीतना उतारी सकी एना आत करी से कि जे मैत्री भाव न पेलू जो पंक्ति एम कहे कि शुभ था आ सकल विश्व न विश्व एश्न आश्व एट विश्व एट द्रव्य नो समूह द्रव्य नो एट क्या द्रव्य है जैन धर्म मान्यता प्रमाण तो आप छ्रव्यो जीव अजीव अजीव में बीजा पांच द्रव्य आएगल मेटर अपने जो रूपी पदार्थों देखाय बधु पुदल कहमें पुदगल शब्द जरा विचित्र अपन लगे पर पुदगल ने अपने इंग्लिश में कहे तो मेटर जो एनीथिंग देट इज विजिबल जेने रूप से गंध है सुगंध है जेने आप दृश्य में लिया सके ये बधु पुदगल में आ जाए बीजा द्रव्य में धर्मास्टिका धर्मास्टिका आकाश ने का बाजू में मूक मुख्य तो आप जीव और पुदगल साथ संबंध है एम आखी कर्मनी चर्चा आए थे तो आप जे आ सकल विश्व मे शुभ था भावना आम डिस्क्रिप्शन आपेलू है तो यहाँ प्रेजेंट लाइफ में आप कई रीत उतारी सकी के सकल विश्व आप शुभ था भावना है तब पुदगल आ जाए 
અહીં આપણે મૈત્રી ભાવ ફક્ત બીજા આપણા સંઘના વ્યક્તિઓ માટે કે આપણા દેશના વ્યક્તિઓ માટે કે દુનિયાની વ્યક્તિઓ એટલા પૂરતા લિમિટ નથી પણ સકળ વિશ્વમાં આપણે મૈત્રી ભાવ છે અને એમાં આપણે જે પૂતગલનો વિચાર કરીએ ને તો આખું એન્વાયરમેન્ટ આવી જશે આપણું આપણે જે એન્વાયરમેન્ટની પણ પૂતગલ આવે છે એના માટે પણ શુભ કાપના રાખી છે આપણું અર્થ છે ક્લાઇમેટ ચેન્જ છે કે આપણે પોલ્યુશન છે એ બધામાં આપણા જૈન ધર્મમાં મૈત્રી ભાવના કીધું છે કે જેથી આપણે એન્વાયરમેન્ટને આપણે પોલ્યુશનને આપણે ક્લાઇમેટ ચેન્જને આપણે દુનિયાને કાંઈ પણ પૃથ્વીને કાંઈ પણ હર્ટ થતું હોય એવી એક્ટિવિટીમાંથી આપણે મૈત્રી ભાવ તરફ આપણી ભાવના કરવાનો પ્રોત્સાહન આપે છે બીજી ભાવના જે છે એ ગુણથી ભરેલા ગુણીજન દેખી હૈયું મારું નૃત્ય કરે અહીં આપણે ગુરુજન તો આપણે સમજી શકીએ કે ગુરુજી હોય કે જે ગુણથી ભરેલા છે પણ આપણે બીજો અર્થ એ પણ લઈ શકાય કે ગુણથી ભરેલા એટલે કે આપણા જોબમાં આપણાથી આગળ નીકળી ગયા હોય કે જેમાં ગુણ વધારે છે કે લોકોની કાબ્યા કેવળ એજ્યુકેશન પ્રમાણે કે લોકોની એબિલિટી પ્રમાણે એ લોકો આપણાથી આગળ નીકળી ગયા છે કે સ્પોર્ટ્સમાં ફર્સ્ટ આવી ગયા છે આપણે આપણે સેકન્ડ આવ્યા ને એ લોકો ફર્સ્ટ આવી ગયા આપણે છેલ્લા આવ્યા ને એ લોકો ફર્સ્ટ કે સેકન્ડ આવી ગયા એ બધા આપણા ગુણીજનો છે કે એ લોકોના તરફ આપણે આદર ભાવ રાખવો જોઈએ એના ઉપર ઈર્ષ્યા નહીં કરવાની એના સાથે કોમ્પિટિશનમાં આપણે પાછળ રહી ગયા તો એમનું ખરાબ નહીં બોલવાનું આપણે એમના તરફ આદર ભાવ રાખવાનું આમાં પ્રોત્સાહન આપેલું છે એટલે આમાં જે ગુણથી ભરેલા ગુણીજન છે એ માત્ર ગુરુઓ માટે નહીં પણ આપણાથી આગળ કોઈ પણ વ્યક્તિ હોય કે આપણી એબિલિટીમાંથી આગળ હોય આપણા એજ્યુકેશનથી આગળ હોય કે આપણા કરતાં સ્પોર્ટ્સમાં આગળ આવી જાય કોઈ પણ રીતના આગળ આવી જતા હોય તો એમના તરફ આદર ભાવની અને મૈત્રી ભાવનું આમાં વર્ણન કરેલું છે ત્રીજી જે ભાવના જે છે દીન ક્રૂર ને ધર્મ વિહોણા એમને દેખી દિલમાં દર્દ રહે કરુણા ભીની આંખોમાંથી આશરુનો સ્ત્રોતો હે કે જે લોકો આપણાથી પાછળ છે કે જે લોકો આપણાથી પાછળ રહી ગયા છે એજ્યુકેશનમાં એબિલિટીઝમાં સ્પોર્ટ્સમાં જે પહેલાં દાખલા પહેલાં છે એ પ્રમાણે જ કે જે એમના તરફ આપણે કરુણા ભાવ રાખવાનો છે એમના તરફ આપણે કે એ લોકો કઈ રીતના આપણી સાથે આવી જાય કઈ રીતના એમને આપણે હેલ્પ કરી શકીએ મદદ કરી શકીએ એનો ભાવ છે કે જે આ કરુણા ભાવમાં આવી જાય છે કમ્પેશન જેને કહેવાય છે ચોથી ભાવના જે છે એ માર્ગ ભૂલેલા પ્રતિકને માર્ગ ચિંધવા ઉભો રહો એ તો બરાબર છે કે કોઈકને આપણે સલાહ આપીએ એડવાઇસ આપીએ પણ એ લોકો એની ઉપેક્ષા કરે ઉપેક્ષા કરે એટલે કે એનું અવગણ કરે એ લોકો ધ્યાનમાં લે એ લોકો આપણને ક્રિટિસાઇઝ પણ કરે કે આ તમે એડવાઇઝ તમને ખોટી આપી રહ્યા છો તો એ તરફ આપણે ક્ષમતા ભાવ રાખવાની વાત કરી છે કે જે લોકોને આપણે એડવાઇસ આપીએ સજેશન આપીએ કે માર્ગદર્શન બતાવીએ અને એ લોકો એ ગણકારે નહીં અવગણના કરે કે એનું ઓપોઝિશન કરે કે એને લે નહીં તો એમના તરફ આપણે ક્ષમતા ભાવ એટલે વી શુડ નોટ બી ગેટિંગ અપસેટ કે એ લોકો કેમ આપણે માયના નહીં કે એમ એમની સાથે એંગળી થયા એ તો નથી માનતો જવા દો એને જસ્તે એવો ભાવ નહીં કરવાનો પણ એને બદલે ક્ષમતા ભાવ માટેની આમાં વર્ણન કરેલું છે તો આ જે ચાર ભાવના જે છે એ આપણા ફક્ત અહીંયા સેન્ટરમાં આવીને ગાવાની અને એનો એટલો અર્થ નથી પણ એનો જિંદગીમાં આપણે પ્રેક્ટિકલી એક એક સ્ટેપમાં આપણે ઉતારી શકીએ આપણે આપણા બિઝનેસમાં ઉતારી શકીએ આપણા વર્ક સ્ટેશનમાં ઉતારી શકીએ આપણા ઘરના સંબંધોમાં ઉતારી શકીએ આપણા કુટુંબીઓ સાથે કે બધા સાથે મૈત્રી ભાવ છે કરુણા ભાવ છે આદર ભાવ છે ક્ષમતા ભાવ છે આ ચાર ભાવો આપણે ધ્યાનમાં રાખીએ તો આપણને આપણું જૈન દર્શન તરફ આપણો માર્ગમાં આપણે આગળ વધી શકીએ છીએ 
આની સાથે આજનું જે આપણું ટોપિક જે છે કે જે હેતાલી કહેવાની છે કે બ્લેક લાઈવ્સ માટે એમાં આપણે જોઈએ તો આ ચારે વસ્તુનો ભાવ આપણને એમાં આવી શકશે કે આપણે મૈત્રી ભાવ રાખવાનો છે એ ફક્ત આપણે આપણા સંબંધીઓ માટે જ નહીં કે આપણા સાધાર્મિક લોકો માટે જ નહીં કે આપણા કુટુંબીજનો કે આપણા દેશના વ્યક્તિઓ એમ દરેક વ્યક્તિ માટે અને દરેક વ્યક્તિમાં પછી એ એનો સ્કીનનો કલર ગમે તેવો હોય કે એની એબિલિટીઝ કેવી હોય કે એની કેરેક્ટરિસ્ટિક્સ કેવી હોય બધા તરફ મૈત્રી ભાવ આદર ભાવ આપણે ક્ષમતા ભાવ કરુણા ભાવ આ બધાનું કરવાનું છે તો આ મંગલ ભાવના સાથે હું અહીંયા મારું સમાપ્ત કરું છું અને પ્રેરણા આપું છું આપણે બધાને થેન્ક યુ Thank you so much, Mahesh Bhai, Hindu Man. Very well said. I remember, you know, when we were in school, we were talking about the word of the word of Pratna. Thanks for explaining detailed meaning. And as you mentioned, it is go very well with uh, the discourse we have today. So I'm sure, you know, we'll be enlightened more in the next one and a half or so. So uh, moving to the next meeting agenda, a presentation from the Pashala kids on one of the projects they recently uh did and you know what we have planned is you know for the next few meetings we are giving this kids few minutes to talk about or showcase their work so <laughs> for that let me hand over to rita win uh thank you ritesh bhai and um uh thank you uh, mahesh bhai also i think even this project and what hetal is going to talk about all of it ties in uh very well uh to what the kids have also worked on so um this is the ingredients project that the mahavir group students uh, have been working on this year and uh purvi and i will briefly go through the background of the project uh provide some details and then two students uh from mahavir group will actually be presenting their findings today so the two students presenting today are uh, vanshi mota and anshi karbhari uh, so uh, let me provide some details as to what they were supposed to do for the project and then purvi will uh, then uh, cover the principle of ahimsa which we are going to uh, talk or learn a lot about today and then she will also briefly cover the importance of the project uh, so purvi the slide are you sharing it why am i not able to see it um yes so if you can move to the next slide so to start with each student uh, had to select a category that they wanted to work on so it could be anything it could be a food related category or any other item that they were interested in finding out more about so in the first part um uh, uh, they had to research different commercially available brands of items in that particular category and um, to add to this so we of course had students pick uh, from a variety of categories so some were food related of course like cereals or ice cream and candies but then we had one student who really uh, loves to eat tacos so he wanted to really dig deeper into all the ingredients that go into tacos and uh, find out more about uh, tacos and then of course we had a couple of students who uh, wanted to work on skin care products uh, or cosmetics so uh, for the first part uh, they researched this commercially available brands find out if they contained any animal products uh, and even dairy products and wherever applicable they could also try to uh, learn how they were made so for example if they contain dairy products they had to think about the mistreatment uh, to the dairy animals in the dairy in industry and the harm that is being caused to the environment in the way that they are manufactured or in certain cases even if animal testing is involved where the animals are not treated properly so to begin with they could use multiple resources to get the information uh, they wanted 
that's what we had encouraged that they could go online they could actually visit the stores and look at different brands and check the ingredients maybe even call the company if they had any questions but with the emergence of this uh, covid-19 pandemic of course the visiting the store part uh, when was out of question so most of what you will hear from the students is uh, what they were able to uh, get through the internet so they had to mainly rely on the internet for that and uh, purvi will uh, cover and as i said the basic principle behind this project was of course non violence or ahimsa and i would say of course as uh, mahesh bhai just mentioned and maybe hitali will have to mention i guess for anti racism it is probably uh, the most important principle but also not completely understood or not correctly understood principle so that's what we were trying to uh, get across to the students uh, while they were working on this project uh, with that purvi uh, will uh, probably try to review uh, that uh, very briefly and also talk about the importance again uh, i would say that the slides that we have has a lot more information than what we can possibly present uh, in in the interest of time today but hopefully we'll have it available for future reference on the website uh, over to you purvi thank you rita ben um now to quickly review the concept of ahimsa it translates as non injury or causing as minimum minimal harm as possible by thought speech or action to yourself to other living beings and to the environment it is ahimsa is a major principle in jainism as well as in many other things Now, within our community, we've been fortunate to have um, Pravin Uncle as well as other scholars who have enlightened us about violence and cruelty that occurs in the dairy industry. So this year, this year when the students uh, worked on this project, um, they examined the ingredients in the in their categories for both vegetarian as well as vegan lifestyles. So, and if we are to continue to boast about how Jains are such astute followers of Ahimsa, then it is time that we put our beliefs into practice. In order to be compassionate towards ourselves, other five sense beings, and to our planet, it is imperative that our community move towards the vegan lifestyle. So we no longer have any excuse since there are many vegan and Jain vegan options available both in grocery stores. and in this run now i will briefly discuss why this project is important at this time in recent years we have seen some natural disasters and um due to the effects of climate change and even with the current covid-19 pandemic we know that some of these major tragedies could have been avoided if we had taken better care of our planet and more people had adopted a human humane vegan lifestyle In fact, more than 70% of no, of novel diseases that emerge to infect people start off uh, have zoonotic origins. It is each it is up to each of us as individuals to question. Are our actions aligned with our principles? We need to be aware about how our diet, rituals, and a way our life in general is impacting our own health. as well as the health of our planet. Now before the students start their presentations, we want to apologize if any of the information that we will be presented against Jain values or principles or causes hurt to any individual. Our students have worked very hard on their individual research projects and we hope you will find it useful. Now I respectfully request Manshi Mota to begin her excellent ingredients presentation. Thank you. and i will share her presentation okay. 
So hi everybody, my name is Funchi Mota. Um, I am the daughter of Kaden and Toro Mota, and today I'm going to be presenting um, ice cream. So my outline for the presentation is um, just talking about four brands of ice cream, Briars, So Delicious, Halo Top, and Ben and & Jerry's, and I'll also be talking about where I can find some vegan ice cream. I'm so sorry. Sorry, why don't you go ahead? It's okay. Um, I think you can go to the next slide. So the first brand is Breyers Ice Cream, and Breyers uses 100% grade A milk and cream, which is the highest quality of milk that you can get. And the cows that the milk come from aren't treated with any artificial growth hormones. The vanilla that goes into their products is 100% sustainable, and it benefits many um, organizations that they work with. Um, Briars uses naturally sourced colors and flavors, and they have a variety of options for all health types, like gluten-free, dairy-free, non-GMO, and lactose-free. And Briars currently has two dairy-free flavors that are vanilla peanut butter and Oreo. You just need to make sure you look for the non-dairy label on the ice cream. The next brand of ice cream is So Delicious Ice Cream, and So Delicious uses plant-based milk. They use almond, cashew, coconut, oat, and soy milk, and they have multiple flavors to choose from. And all of their ice cream is completely dairy-free, non-GMO, project verified, and certified vegan. Halo Top Ice Cream has two options. You can have um, dairy ice cream, or you can get vegan ice cream. And some options that come in both categories are birthday cake, candy bar, and peanut butter cup. And if you want dairy-free or vegan ice cream, you need to look for the blue dairy-free packaging that's on the lid. Some of the flavors are made with coconut milk for the vegan flavors. Their ice creams um, are made on equipment that might process tree nuts, milk, eggs, and peanuts. So. You need to be aware of that if you have any allergies. Their dairy ice creams contain skim milk and eggs. The last brand is Ben & Jerry's Ice Cream, and all of Ben & Jerry's non-dairy flavors are 100% certified vegan. They're made with almond milk or sunflower butter, and currently they have 15 flavors that are vegan. And even though Ben & Jerry's um, non-vegan ice cream has eggs. The eggs um, come from hens that are treated with proper conditions and monitored by veterinary professionals. Some grocery stores that you can get vegan and non-vegan ice creams are at Harris Teeter, Whole Foods, Target, Trader Joe's, and Walmart. And most ice cream stores also include vegan flavors. And the Parlor is one popular ice cream shop in Durham that isn't completely vegan, but they offer many vegan options, like vegan fruit sorbets, some vegan ice cream flavors that are derived from coconut milk, and they have vegan baked treats, so that's a great place to check out. And um, I went vegan for Parusian. I tried it for the first time. I thought it was a very interesting and new experience for me. And since I've never done it, it did feel a little odd since I always drink Bon Vita and um, I use milk for that. So it tasted a little different with soy milk, but I thought it was really cool. So I might go vegan again. Good job, Does anybody have any questions for Banshee? Good job, Banshee. Thank you. Any questions or should we go on to the next presentation? Okay, Purvi.
Okay, I have a question. Yes, okay. Sure. So, can you, uh, two questions actually. Can you share this slide to us? And um, one more question. So, briars, can we eat briars or no? Um, yeah, Briars has vegan and non-vegan options. So you can, um, if you are vegan or not vegan, you can still eat Briars ice cream. Okay, thank you. Who is asking the question? I am not able to see. Aro? Okay. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. So, one comment. Uh, uh, thank you, Vanshi. Uh, it's good to know. This is Maheshwarya. It's so good to know that okay, Vegan options are available at so many of the standard uh, grocery stores, uh, Harris Teeter, Walmart, Aldi's, etc. So that's very good to know. Thank you. Of course. Uh, some, Thank you. some option you saw us, it is new to me. So I'm so happy to see those. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you. And uh, to Arav's uh, point, yes, uh, we will be able to share uh, the slides at some point. So. But thank you for the question. Okay, Anshi is done. Uh, okay, now Anshi Kabari will speak about the project on King Make sure you're unmuted, Anshi. Anji? Anji, are you talking? Uh, hello? Anji, we cannot hear you. We cannot hear you, uh, Keur Bhai. Can, um, can someone check the WebEx to make sure she's unmuted? Yeah, so this is Ketan. I have unmuted Anshi. Anshi, can you can you talk? Make sure your microphone is on on your device. Okay, we see you now. Yeah, I think we just cannot hear her. She's trying to say something. Oh. Should we go on to Hazali's presentation for now or and then come back to us? Uh, yeah, we could uh, possibly do that. Let's give them a minute or so and uh, where are they? Let me see them now. I think they have disconnected and they are joining back. Okay. So Ritesh Bhai, what would you want to do then? Do you want to move on? Yes, I think we should move on and uh, we'll come back to Anshi. Yeah, that sounds fine. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. So great job on the research and this project. It was very well analyzed and explained. And we are looking forward for more presentation like this. Uh, so next meeting agenda is today's discourse. And I'm really excited to announce that today we have a EU scholar, Yes, he is scholar Hitali Ludaya, who is going to talk on one of the difficult topics that is anti racism. Hitali is currently working. I, I know most of us know Hitali, but just giving you know a little background about her. She is uh, currently working as a law clerk uh, for a judge in Detroit, and uh, she hopes to do long term work related to improving public education and our public schools. Uh, she has also been very involved in YJ, Young Jains of America, serving on different board positions. And as a local representative from JSCNC, uh, she is working there as a, I think, you know, more than 10 years or so. And she and her family moved to JSCNC in 2011. And she is very proud to be part of a, such a strong Jain community. Uh, uh, Ritesh, can you hear us? This is Keur and Anche. 
Yeah, I'll come back to you once Sitali's presentation is over. All right. But yeah, I can hear you. All right. So coming back to Hitali's uh, introduction, uh, personally, when I talked to her on this difficult topic, I found her very focused, confident. And so without taking much time, I request Hitali Ludaya to begin her discourse on Jainism, compassion, and anti-racism. Over to you, Hitali. Thank you, Ritesh Bhai. Jai Jinanda, everybody. Also, I realized that I said that we moved to North Carolina in, in 2011, and it was definitely 2007. But, you know, that's what <laughs> it's it, you just lose track of time because it's it's been so great. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity from the, the committee and the community to, to speak on this topic. I and if you see me looking in different places, I you know I have my presentation, but I also have the chat up. So if uh, you have questions along the way, I'll do my best to incorporate them or answer them. Or if not, I can try to answer them later uh, by by email. Um, I want today, hopefully, to expand on a conversation that's been happening for the past few months and that I think it's really important for us to discuss as a Jin community, which is this connection between Jinism and anti-racism and what it means for what we all do day to day in our lives. Um, so these are sort of the three topics I want to cover, um, some things that I want us to learn and speak about, some things that I want us to reflect on, and then some ways in which we might be able to take action. Um, and I know that um, the Bacha teachers are planning on uh, also having this conversation with their students after we uh, have it here. So I'm hoping that um, for the parents out there, if you learn some things here, you're able to then have those those conversations with, with your students as well. Uh, I'm going to be doing some uh, interactive uh, pieces like this. So if you have another device or if you have a phone, um, the instructions are up at the top for how you can participate. Um, so this is the, the question that I want to start out with is, how is everybody feeling about the, the current social situation in this country? Um, you can uh, text, you know, any any message, any feelings, emotions, uh, thoughts that you're having, and, and they'll show up on the screen and, and we can kind of see how everyone is doing. Um, if you are not on, if you don't want to use this platform, you can also just send them in the chat. Um, but this platform is, is anonymous. Um, So again, there's those two options. You can either use the, the web link, which should work on a phone or a computer, or you can use the text feature. Yeah, and I do think there's somebody who's not muted who's causing a little bit of feedback. I don't know who it is, but. I feel this one. Uh, I don't know if anybody else agrees, but I definitely do. Any others? I really encourage you to, to respond here. Sure. And we'll do a couple more of these. So if you don't have your device on you right this second, you can you can get one for the next one. Mm -hmm. And I think with all of these feelings, uh, there there can also come a feeling of 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 what what do I do? How do I, what is going on? Like how did it get to be this way? What am I supposed to do about it as one person? What is my role? And all of these emotions are. Are difficult, right? They they tax us and they make it hard for us to do our our day to day lives and and live in the way that we would want to. So I hope and and I really do. Some of the stuff that I'm going to speak about might be heavy or um, uh, upsetting or or something along those lines. But I, I really hope that we walk away from this conversation uh, hopeful and and with ideas about what you can do to alleviate some of these these feelings that you might be feeling. So I said I wanted to to start out by learning 
Um, I am not a Jain scholar, though I really appreciate that. Um, I don't know that I'm any kind of scholar, but I'll do the best that I can. So um, I want to speak a little bit about Black history in the United States. And in, in speaking about racism, most people who um, took the survey that uh, the committee was kind enough to send around for me felt comfortable explaining what that is. So racism as the idea that some people are inherently better than others, or that some groups of people will use their power to harm others of a different race than them. And racism can affect any minority group, right, including South Asians. But what I want to focus on today is racism against the Black community. Why? In the United States, because of particular aspects of history that I'll speak about, Racism affects the Black community particularly significantly, and understanding that is really important to understanding how it has become a part of American society as a whole, and I think that helps us then understand what we can and should be doing about it as Janes. Um, and I also think some of this background information is stuff that you may not have, particularly if you didn't uh, go to school in this country or take history classes in this country. So that's my, my goal with this material. Uh, so this is kind of a, a timeline that helps us situate how this uh, has evolved over time. Um, and it begins with slavery. The first slaves came to the Americas in 1916. Um, they were almost all from uh, West African countries and were brought to both North and South America and some of the island nations. And I do want to clarify that this was slavery. It was not colonization. It was not indentured servitude. Uh, but people were literally taken from their homes in these countries and put on ships and brought here to do work for no pay. Um, and slavery existed because it was economically strategic, you know, with large crops like sugar and cotton and coffee. Obviously, you can make more money if you don't have to pay your laborers. And slaves were seen as as less than human, not not even just you know, a different race or a different kind of human, but less than human. Um, and that understanding, in fact, persisted into the creation of this country. Uh, so if you have young students who are in US history, you may have heard them speak about the three-fifths compromise. So when this country's constitution was written, um, you know, we have two bodies in Congress, the House of Representatives and the Senate. The Senate is divided. Uh, exactly proportionally, so two senators per state, and the House of Representatives is based on population. And when the Constitution was being written, there was a question of how to count the population uh, in the states. Um, folks who were from states where there were not as many slaves didn't want slaves to count towards the population count. And uh, Southern uh, delegates mostly did want slaves to count towards the population count because that would mean that their states would get more representatives. And the compromise that they ended up achieving was the three-fifths compromise. So for determining the population of a state, uh, the, the population, uh, any, any slave in a state would be counted as three-fifths of a person uh, towards the, the full count of how many people lived in that state. And that was the, the balance that was achieved to make both sides happy. And, and the result was that this entire group of people was specifically categorized as being less than a, a full human. And slavery ended officially uh, at the end of the Civil War with the passage of the, the 13th Amendment, which is, is here on the screen. Um, but as you can imagine, not everyone in society was ready for slavery to be immediately over, right? There had been a war about it, and people didn't agree about whether it should continue to exist or not. So it, it's uh, not quite accurate to say that slavery was resolved with the passage of the 13th Amendment. And there's at least two lasting legacies of slavery that indicate some of the ways in which we haven't resolved it at all. The first is the 13th Amendment loophole. So you can see the line that's um, underlined in the 13th Amendment that slavery is, is not allowed except as a punishment for crime. So uh, we are still constitutionally in this country permitted to have people work for very little or no pay if it is somehow as part of punishment for crime. And that provision is the basis for our current uh, system 
of low wage labor that exists in in prisons across the country. So you, you may have heard it as, as sort of a joke that license plates and things like that are, are made by prisoners, but it's true. And, and this isn't something that I knew for most of my life, uh, but there's so many uh, different things that are a part of our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, furniture, uh, highways and road maintenance, grinding the lenses for glasses, making license plates. Um, these uh, functions are, are performed by prisoners um, and they are paid anywhere between 20 cents an hour to $1.50 an hour, depending on the state and depending on the work. Um, and if you look at the, the picture in the top right, um, in some states, and, and particularly right now in California, uh, prisoners also do uh, emergency response work and firefighting work. So right now there's a lot of wild, wildfires um, in California and um, there's uh, large uh, crews of volunteer firefighters who are actually prison inmates um, who are paid $2 a day plus a, a dollar for every hour that they work doing this work, the exact same work that firefighters who are, you know, employed by their, their cities are doing. Um, and, and you might have a question of, you know, why does this matter? If they're in prison, what do they need money for anyway? While uh, basic necessities are, are provided to an extent in, in prisons, it's also a reality of prison life that there are things that you have to buy for yourself. Um, if you want to buy extra food, if you want to buy soap, if you want to buy things like uh, reading and writing paper, um, sometimes certain privileges cost money, things like magazines or books can cost money, phone calls cost money. So in the federal prisons, um, there's been some reform legislation in the past couple of years and phone calls are capped at 21 cents a minute. Uh, but in some state run prisons, it can cost a dollar or more per minute to make phone calls. So, you know, imagine um, doing the sorts of work where you might make maybe two, three, four, five dollars in a day, and that gets you five minutes on, on the phone. Um, and if uh, your family or your community don't have the money to be, give you funds, that money is, is the only money that you have. Um, the only reason we can have that system, that sort of subsidized uh, system of labor is because of this loophole in the 13th Amendment. And, and this picture was taken in the earliest early 20th century, these are some prison laborers, um, but it, it still happens today, every day. So the second enduring legacy of the way we resolved but didn't really resolve slavery um, was Jim Crow laws. Um, so Jim Crow was a derogatory name that white individuals, particularly in the South, used to refer to black people. And that's what this uh, body of laws uh, is called. Um, Jim Crow laws were passed throughout the South as a way to keep portions of society fundamentally segmented or cut off for the black community. So even though slavery was no longer technically allowed, there were still many, many vested interests in society and people who didn't want the black community to be able to fully participate. So Jim Crow laws made it legal to discriminate in hiring, to have separate facilities in uh, public parks and in pools, in schools, um, made it legal to give different amounts of resources to different groups of people, made it legal to uh, discriminate in housing. Um, and can, as you can imagine, this is just a systematic uh, underfunding of the Black communities across the country that happened. And if you don't have access to funding and access to resources, you're not able to provide the services that people need. And again, I, I think it's important to think about this in the context of everything else that I just spoke about. So imagine you have an entire segment of society who for hundreds of years, for generations, has been treated as less than human. They weren't able to earn money. They weren't able to work. They didn't have control over their own lives who suddenly are trying to do that. They're trying to build lives. They're trying to build savings, perhaps buy property or land and get an education. And at every turn, they're met by obstacles and barriers and challenges that no white person in that same society had to face. And the Supreme Court validated this approach um, in this uh, decision called Plessy versus per Ferguson. And the bottom line of Plessy is that the Supreme Court said that separate but equal facilities are totally acceptable under the Constitution. And by equal, they didn't mean exactly the same. They just meant 
you know, if something exists. So, so this cartoon gives you a sense. In Plessy, the, the Supreme Court said that if there's a water fountain that white people can use and a water fountain that black people can use, that's it, that's enough. And it doesn't matter that the water fountain that white people can use is cleaner and easier to access and properly repaired. And the water fountain that is only open for black people to use is none of those things. Um, this decision wasn't overturned until the 1950s. And it's the reason that Jim Crow laws were able to survive for, for so long. Um, and, and Jim Crow laws are just one subset of laws and policies, both at the state and federal level that took those ideas of slavery and racism and begin to incorporate them into structures in our society. So when I say throughout this presentation that there's a difference between being not racist and being anti-racist, this is why. Because of these structures in our society, it's possible to be not racist. It's possible to individually not believe that any human is better than any other human. But just by our day-to-day -day actions, we still perpetuate some of these problems and some of these structures because they are baked in to the systems that we live in. Um, I've spoken about this one before, um, but if you've heard the term redlining, um, that's that's one example um, that I want to share briefly. So this is a, a map of, of Durham. Um, and in the early 1930s, um, there was a federal agency that was charged with making maps like this of cities that outlined where it would be low risk or high risk to offer loans and mortgages. So these maps, you know, physically delineated green areas that were low risk and red areas that were high risk. And that's why we call it redlining. Um, so this is Durham's security map from 1937. And neighborhoods that tended to be marked in red were usually what we would call inner city neighborhoods, and they were usually predominantly black. And these federal agencies explicitly endorsed this criteria. They said the reason for doing it this way was that in neighborhoods where there was going to be racial mixing, um, that was going to be risky, um, that putting black homeowners too close to white homeowners was going to drive down property values. So that was an, a reason to rate them lower. And so this these maps affected the way that federal funding was distributed. Private real estate agents and banks would later use these maps to steer black families away from certain neighborhoods or make it impossible for them to get loans in certain neighborhoods. So Redline communities tended to get less investment, which resulted in lower property values, which meant that these communities couldn't uh, collect as much in property taxes. And we all know that property taxes fund things like schools and social services and everything else that you need for a safe and happy and healthy community. Uh, so this is what I want to point out as an example of systemic racism that is, is baked into our systems. This doesn't require and nobody claims that every person who's ever participated in this process was themselves racist. But the system, as it has been created, has led to inequitable outcomes that have effects even today, right? We know that property values are different in different communities and the quality of schools is different in different communities. And a lot of those are a legacy of the way that these maps were drawn. Uh, many of you uh, on this call own your own home, right? That's part of the equity that you have that's allowed you to to do well, to send your children to school, to support your families, to send money back home to, to India. And if imagine if in all this time that you've you've been in this country, if if rather than owning that home or paying that mortgage, if you had been paying rent because you couldn't get a loan, because nobody would give you a mortgage. And and the only home that you could have bought was in an area where the public schools were were not as good. Um, those are choices that because of some of these policies, lots of people, but particularly people in the Black community, have been facing for decades and still face today. So in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, there was a growing movement in all avenues of society to try to change some of these things. Um, much as there were Indian soldiers who fought for the British in World War I and World War II, there were many, many distinguished Black servicemen who fought in World War I and World War II on behalf of the United States. But 
a, a similar story. You know, they came back home after the war and found out that they were still being treated as entirely second class individuals in their own country. Um, and that's just one of the, the reasons that these movements began, um, the civil rights movement began to try to uh, call for change across the United States. And the culmination of the civil rights movement was the Civil Rights Act of 1964, um, which was signed by President Lyndon Johnson, who's here. Um, the Civil Rights Act established a number of laws that outlaw outright discrimination and the kinds of discrimination that the Jim Crow laws accomplished. Um, and it was very important, but something to note is that a lot of the damage had already been done, right? One law couldn't undo generations of consistent treatment that put one group of people lower in society than another. And, and some of those effects are the ones that we still see in present day. And those effects are the things that people are speaking about now and that they are, are trying to cause, uh, create change around. And, uh, you, you know, all that would have been bad enough as it is, um, but there's a compounding problem that's the expansion of our prison and jail system that began in the 1970s. You might have wondered earlier if I said that I wanted to talk bla about black history, why am I speaking about jails and prisons? Anybody can go to jail or prison, but that's because black Americans are disproportionately represented in our prison system as compared to any other group. So in the early 1970s, during the Nixon administration, Congress passed a series of laws that expanded our prison system. And if you if you just step back and think with me for a second, what is a crime, right? Legally, it's it's whatever it's defined to be. It's whatever the law says that a crime is. So the laws passed in the 1970s expanded the criminal code, expanded the range of things that could become a crime, changed the way we do sentencing, um, and these laws did not, in the most part, succeed on doing what they were supposed to be doing, which was addressing a problem of, of drugs in our society or, or the war on drugs. Um, but they have succeeded in creating a criminal justice system where statistically you will have different outcomes in terms of whether you are stopped, arrested, convicted, how long you serve based on your race and based on your level of income, not just based on whether you committed a crime and what crime you committed. Uh, and so for some context, this is what our prison population was like. It was very level until the 70s. And we now have 25% of the uh, world's prison population, even though we only have 5% of the world's population. Um, and our prison system costs over $80 billion each year. Um, and again, to emphasize why this is a particular issue to think about with regards to the black community, a few statistics, a black person is five times more likely to be stopped without a reason than a white person. Uh, in 2014, uh, African Americans were 34% of the total corrections population. Um, which is much higher than the percent of the population that they are. Um, and they're incarcerated at a rate five times that that um, white individuals are, are incarcerated. Um, and if you haven't seen 13 on Netflix, um, this is a really great documentary that goes through sort of the legacy of the 13th Amendment and the relationship to the prison system today. And I really, really recommend it. And you know, this summer we've been reminded of the ways that the criminal justice system treats black people differently than others. And, and that's in the rates of police violence and, and deadly interactions with police. So this is just a partial list of, of black individuals who've been killed by the police since 2014. Um, these are just some of the ones that have made national headlines, right? We know that there are many, many more. Um, and I'll just take a moment. So that's some brief history regarding the black community in the United States. And again, if, if you have questions or if there's something that you, I, I said that you wanna know more about, or I said that was confusing to you, please, please put the question in the chat or send the question to me privately and I'm, I'm happy to answer it. So I said that racism was a concept that can apply to anyone. So why did I wanna focus on the black community? In part to contrast to what our own experiences as immigrant families might be. The history of the South Asian community in the United States is much shorter 
right? There was some immigration from India in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, but it really didn't grow. And I think most, if not all of the people on this, on this call didn't come to the United States until the 1960s after the Immigration and Nationality Act was passed. And you'll notice that's around the same time that the Civil Rights was Act, the Civil Rights Act was passed. Um, the United States was dealing with a crisis regarding their international legitimacy. You know, the world was looking at the United States and saying, wait, you say that you're this big, you know, uh, center for democracy and everyone is free and et cetera, et cetera. But what is this civil rights movement that's happening? What are these immigration controls that you have where no one can get into your country? Um, so both the Civil Rights Act and the INA are, are related in terms of the reasons why they were eventually passed. So have we as a community, the South Asian community, experienced racism? Of course. Some of you all have told me those stories about your early years working here. There was so much profiling that happened after 9-11. There were the Gurdwara shootings that have happened over the past um, few years. All of those things are wrong, and we should be involved in efforts to address those wrongs. But the discrimination faced by the Black community is different in the way that is so deeply embedded in the history and structures of this country. And as citizens and residents of this country, if we don't learn about it, we're likely to continue it on, perhaps without even realizing it. So some time for reflection. This first question that I want to ask is, what do you think a justice system and a society based on Jane principles would look like? And, and just sort of the first thoughts that, that come to your mind. Mm hmm Definitely. Yep. Mm hmm And and while some of these answers come in, what I what I wanna emphasize is that I I hope you have some sense based on what I've shared with you so far that this is not the, the system that we have for a variety of reasons, some of them active and some of them passive. This is not what the system that we have in this country of justice, and it's, it's not in some ways what our society is. But so what? Just because our society doesn't embody a lot of important Jane values, you know, does, does that mean that we have to do anything about it? After all, not everyone in the United States is, is Jane. Um, I'm going to explain what I think is the reason that Jainism calls on us to learn about these issues and to actively do something about them. And I, um, you know, I, as I said, I am not a scholar. I've, I've spoken with um, some folks about these topics, but uh, Pravin uncle or Mahesh uncle, um, if there's any input uh, near the end that you want to offer, I'm, I'd really appreciate that if there's things that you feel like I'm, I'm missing. So, so let's speak about what Jainism does ask of us in terms of our duties to our fellow living beings, right? Ahimsa, treating everyone with compassion, Seva, uh, doing service, um, and Jivdeya, or, or having compassion for, for all living beings. Uh, these uh, activities that I've listed at the bottom are some of the ways that we engage in them as a society. Right. So we have a lot of individuals who volunteer with Virayatan doing um, education and uh, work for um, empowerment um, of, of students in India. Um, we do highway cleanup. We do food bank volunteering. And I think those are all really important and good activities. And they all are in line with those principles of Jainism. And the uh, proposal that I want to make to you is supporting racial justice and anti-racism work fits in with those principles of Jainism in just the same way that all of these other things do. Uh, my mom founded this really great quote from the Dalai Lama, which I think emphasizes the reasons why these issues fall in with Ahimsa, Seva, and Jivdeya just the way as those other volunteering activities do. And, and the bottom line of, of this quote is that we are all equal as humans. And all of these principles of Jainism talk about caring for our fellow human beings. In this country, in this time, 
part of caring for our fellow human beings has to involve understanding the history and what has happened before and how it's affecting our society today. And I don't think that's a political issue or something that's controversial. I think it's just a part of our reality in the same way that poverty or hunger or homelessness are all realities that we know that people face. The effects of this history of discrimination and racism are also a reality that people face. And if we are moved because of our Jain beliefs to do something about poverty and hunger and homelessness, then we should also be moved to do something about this. And there might be this question again, of, but I, I don't get why this means I need to be involved as a Jain person. What does Jivdaya or Seva have to do with protests or voting or learning about racism? And I understand that, uh, I, I agree. <laughs> I understand that it might feel different in some ways than the other kinds of service and volunteering that we're used to doing. Um, but that, that's what I want to propose to you, that it's it's not. All of these are fundamental issues of human rights and all of them demand action from us. And if this is new and different and it's a different kind of action than the action you've taken before in your life, that's OK. We're all learning together, but I, I don't think they're distinct from each other. I think it's possible to interpret Jainism in a narrow way, right, to say that um, we should be at all times concerned with our uh, spiritual progress and we should be thinking about our actions in the context of, you know, what is the immediate follow up? Is something that I do going to lead to some pop or lead to something else? Um, and that way of thinking about Jainism and our actions, I think, is is limiting. Uh, but the the Jainism that I have, have been brought up to understand is one that is really focused on our bhav and really focused on our intentions. And if our bhav is to live out these principles of ahimsa and seva and jivdaya, as particularly because we are shravaks and shravikas living in this country, I don't think that we can ignore these issues, right? None of us, as far as I know um, here, plans to take diksha, plans to remove ourselves from society. So if we're making the choice to live in society, to then sort of put blinders on and say, well, my jinnin is only about my own spiritual progress, feels like it is not being totally honest about what the situation is to me. And, and because these issues are all at the societal level, they're something that we participate in, whether we like it or not. Um, and let me, let me give you an example. So say um, you're at a work event um, and you are, are responsible for, for buying the lunch for everybody. Um, and, and something that I think many of us would agree on is that we would ask or encourage that everyone buy a vegetarian meal, uh, that, that we would want, uh, we, we, if we're the ones paying for it, we don't want to be paying for non-vegetarian food. Why is that? Even if we're not eating the meat ourselves, we are participating in its consumption and we're allowing that consumption to happen. So I don't think these these issues are, are any different. If you yourself don't speak negatively about black people or the black community, but you don't learn about these issues and learn about the ways that you might be involved. You don't speak up when someone says something like, oh, you know, that area is dangerous. If we close our eyes and ears to these issues because they don't affect us as individuals, isn't that the same as paying for the restaurant bill and just not looking? to see what anybody ordered or not asking anybody to avoid ordering the meat. And, and I think this, this point in the chat about what is the difference between non-racism and anti-racism, that's what I'm trying to emphasize is I think it's, it's very possible for somebody to not be racist in terms of how they uh, think about others and speak and, and interact with others. But that's different than the active practice of being anti-racist and finding ways to actively work to push back against these things. And uh, something I want to emphasize before moving on, and again, if you take one thing from this presentation, 
let it be this, it's that the problems of racism and discrimination are deeply embedded in our society. They exist in our schools and in our workplaces and in the companies that we support and the products we buy and in the actions that we take. And what that means, if we don't educate ourselves, then we're perpetuating, we can, we can be perpetuating the problem. Um, so I won't spend a, a lot of time on this, um, but it, because again, many folks said that they felt like they, they understood it. Um, but again, when we talk about racism and anti-racism, um, there's there's a difference in in terms of the actions that you take. And uh, these are some resources uh, that I, I think Ritesh Bhai, I think these slides can get emailed um, if I, I'm speaking entirely in English. Um, and if these are helpful um, to understand more or if there's something that you want to share, um, I think they, they actually have really good explanations in, in Hindi and Gujarati. Sure, sure, we can do that. Great. Um, so what then, if, if I've said that I, I think that anti-racism is really tied to these core values and principles that we are supposed to follow. So what does Jainism say about anti-racism? And, and the answer, in, at least in the original text that we have, is, is nothing, right? Um, in, in the society that existed at the time of, of Mavri Bhagwan, um, th that was essentially a racially homogenous society. So uh, there's nothing that, that I or anyone else can point you to in our Jain texts that says that you should be anti-racist. But uh, our religion is something that has to adapt and, and grow and change over time as our situations and circumstances change. And I think that our understanding of the basic principles on which Mahavir Bhagwan founded the religion helps us understand why anti-racism follows from some of these things. So at the time of Mahavir Bhagwan, women's rights were severely limited, right? Many of you may know the, the story of Chandan Bala. I, I mean, she was being sold um, as a, as, as a, a laborer. Um, and when Mahavir Bhagwan expanded the, the, sung the fourfold older order to include sadvijis and to include uh shavikas he didn't establish any kind of hierarchy between sadhus and sadvijis between shavaks and shavikas everyone was equal to him right he was gautam swami's guru as much as he was chandan Bharat's guru and he was sulsa shavikas guru as much as he was anand shavak's guru and that's different from what the existing Brahmin order in the society was at that time. Um, so if we understand that what he was saying is that we don't differentiate between people in any way. At that time, the application that was most important in the society was around gender. But I think that that principle applies in the same way to our society that we're in today. Um, you know, the title of this presentation was what can we do to make our communities better? And, and this is the, the sort of core proposal that I'm making to you, that it's part of our duty as Jains because of the principles of Ahimsa and Seva and Jivdeya to make our communities better, particularly if we have chosen to live in the world as Shravaks and Shravikas. To me, Jainism has always taught me that I need to then be doing my part to lessen the suffering of others and to make things better. And in the US in particular, because of the history of what has happened to others in this country, I think that requires learning about discrimination and anti-racism and then deciding what actions I as an individual am going to take to try to combat those. And I think that's crucial to making our, our communities better. I really appreciate everything that that my uncle shared um, in speaking about Maitri Bhavanu. I, I think we, we were saying a lot of the same things that we, you know, we, we don't make distinctions between people and, and it's part of living our faith and our ideals to understand what it means to truly treat all with the same level of um, compassion and respect. So. I have a few things to wrap up with that are like action items, but um, my uncle or, or Barbie uncle, if there's anything that you think that I, I missed that you wanted to, to add right now, I, I wanted to pause.
If not, that's okay too. <laughs> okay, uh, let me make a few comments. All right. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. The uh, Bhagwan Mahavir was a revolutionary person. Okay. The kind of the society what he was in at that time, the women had no right for religion things, okay, to be equal in the religions area, okay. But yet Bhagwan Mahavi you know, took a bold step, initiated Chandan Bala the day he established fourfold order of the Jain Sangh. However, if you look into it later on, the society influence on equality on a woman is so overriding that, that they took all the power away from the society, from the women, basically that women cannot do rituals, cannot you know, drive the rituals, cannot uh, uh, do sutras, they cannot recite this one, they cannot you know, lead in some sect of Jainism, which is like majority, okay, in a sense, that they cannot do sermon, they cannot sit on the bench and you know, deliver the sermons. Even today, they cannot even read Jain literature, Jain scriptures, Agam, okay? It takes significant effort to overcome this kind of the situation, all right? And things are changing, I'm not disputing that way, okay? Uh, nobody stops it now, but at the same time, okay, if you really look into, there is a group of the people we invite in this country even, okay? And they come and say, look, they, they, the women cannot do these things. We cannot accept their saying and their performance of the rituals or alone. You will never find any of the Jain society doing that big uh, things, no, any rituals performed by the woman, okay? Have you, I haven't seen it. I mean, you no, know, that, that is being you know, accepted by, by these things. The, there so certain rituals I'm talking about. No, some rituals they do it because uh, they are the only one knew all the sutras. Anyway, so my comment is we got to look into it. You give us a good insight about all these you no know, situation. Right. But in the Jain community today, there is a significant uh, racism exists between men and women in a Sravak and Sadhvis also. In the sadhvis, the same thing that exists, we got to look into it. And we, if we don't do it at our level, we don't expect the monks and nuns are going to do it. Okay? They, 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 that's, that's my comment. Anyway. Okay? Thank you. Yeah, this is, this is one issue of, of many, but I think it's helpful to think about how they're, they're related. Okay, my uncle, I'm, I'm going to assume you didn't have anything to say, and I'll keep going. But stop me if you if you did. Um, so uh, I'll say it one more time. This is a lot of information, and if you have any questions or anything along those lines, please feel free to to send to me. Um, and I, I am more than happy to speak about them more. And I would love to to help think through anything that is that that you are thinking about. So. I think actions can be big and small, right? So I want to be clear, there are big changes that will be needed in our society to truly say that we have made progress on some of these issues. And you could be involved in those by voting or by running for office or for all the Bachao students who are out there by making this a part of the work you want to do in your career, in your life. But I, I don't think those are the only kinds of actions that you can take. I think the starting point of any action is education, and learning more about these issues. And as you learn more, I think you'll discover ways that you can act that don't aren't always necessarily very big, but that do make a difference. So, so here's a, a few examples. You know, in the same way that you might choose not to buy products from a company that you have learned treats animals poorly or that exploits their workers in China or Bangladesh or India. What if you chose not to buy products from companies that employ prison labor? at below market prices after doing some research. 
What if, if you're a parent in your child's school, you wrote a letter to their teacher or their principal asking to learn more about how these historical issues of racism are discussed in the classroom and letting them know that it's important to you that your child has a full understanding of these issues. What if you had a committee of parents who wrote a letter or an email like that, right? What if during this holiday season, when you're doing your shopping, you chose to seek out black owned businesses or to support nonprofits that specifically work in primarily black communities, because you now know that those communities have historically had access to funding and investment denied to them. I encourage you to think about these actions in the same way that you think about uh, what the Pacha students have reminded us about today, reading ingredient labels at the store, learning about our food products, the way you think about recycling or environmental causes, the way that my uncle spoke about, or, or any other small actions that you take on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the internet is a really great resource. We're really lucky to have it. And there's a lot that you can learn about the small actions that you can take that uh, make a, a difference on, on these issues. Um, and again, these will be emailed around, but if there's specific issues that you want to learn more about, I think these are all good starting resources and you can go from there. The last thing that I want to talk about very quickly and very specifically today is voting because it is timely. Um, we have less than 50 days um, to the election. And um, I Again, this is just my perspective and, and my point of view, but I'll, I'll present it to you and you can take it for what you will. Voting and participating and that civic duty is very much to me something that comes from my Jainism and coming from comes from these issues. Why? Um, so I think it's, it's a civic duty. It's part of our citizenship here, right? It's a privilege that we get. Um, I think it matters for these sort of practical reasons Elected officials create the policy structures and frameworks that we live in. And we've just talked about all the ways in which some of these things are baked into our societies. If we want those to change, we have to have elected officials who share in that vision. And you might not think that elected officials or particularly Congress are very fast in terms of doing things, but I can assure you that every day they stop things from happening, right? There are policies and procedures and laws in place that have been in place for a long time that prevent progress on some of these issues. And the only way we slowly start to address those is by having people in elected office who feel comfortable making change and changing the status quo. Uh, so this is the second to last of my polls, and this is a really, really quick one. It's just a, a B, or C, yes, no, or not sure. Do you feel comfortable encouraging others to vote? Uh, your friends, your family, people in your social circles? Do you feel comfortable saying, hey, are you registered? Do you have a plan? Where are you voting? Are you getting an absentee ballot? Are you going to go in person? How are you going to make this happen? At least somebody is really on board, which I'm excited about. I'll give it a few more seconds. Okay, most of us are, which I'm really excited about. Uh, so now I wanna know why or, or why not? Um, what is it about that, about discussing politics, discussing voting, discussing your plan for voting that you either, you do it and, and you think there's a reason it's important for you to do it or you're, you're, not, you're not comfortable doing it. You don't, you don't have those conversations. Okay, yes. So there is a consequence uh, of, of not voting, of, of not being involved. Yeah, seeing this as a way that we can make change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's something that we owe to ourselves and to society. If the people out there who said that they're not comfortable voting want to tell me directly afterwards why not i would love to to know but uh but i understand that that it's it's 
for for some of us, it's it's just not a natural conversation. It's not something that we're used to talking about, um, and it's not something that maybe is a part of our relationships with some people in our lives. Um, and I I what I want to put out to you as a as a statistic or a piece of information that one of the things that uh, is most determinative in whether someone ends up actually voting or not is whether they have articulated out loud to somebody else a voting plan, even if it's just saying to somebody else, oh yeah, I'm gonna go on Tuesday after work. Somebody who has a plan like that in their head of how they are going to make voting happen is much more likely to vote than someone who does not. And so having these conversations with our friends and our families about what our voting plans are does actually make a difference in, in eventual voter participation. And you know, these are some of the things that, that you might yourself feel or that you might have heard other people say about voting in terms of, you know, my vote doesn't really matter, the system is rigged, it's, it's not, it's not going to make a difference. And when I said that to me, voting in civic participation feels very tied towards Jainism, it's because it's a sort of repudiation of some of these ideas. Um, so we've heard in, in other lectures and, and in Pravinankal Swadhyay about the idea of purusharth and, and, and self-effort. You know, there are some things that are not within our control, but this one as a mechanism for trying to create change in our society, this one is, right? And, and the only way to guarantee that your vote doesn't change anything is if you don't vote. I completely agree and completely sympathize that sometimes some of this is is true, right? There, there, are, there are elected officials who don't act or behave or conduct themselves or take the responsibility of the job in the way that they should. Uh, but that's not everyone, and particularly at the levels of local government, the things that elected officials do really affect our lives in the day-to-day. -day. Uh, before every primary and every election, my family does some reading on the different candidates. We share you know, articles in our WhatsApp group, and we speak together about what we've learned from friends or colleagues. And you know, we don't necessarily all always vote for the same people, but we try to make sure that each of us is informed. And we try to make sure that that's a conversation that we have together as a group. And, and I think that that's one way in which we can push back on these ideas that our self-effort or our participation don't matter at all. Voting is not going to fix everything, but I think it is one of the most important ways that we can make change in society. And I really also think it's a form of compassionate action, right? It shows that we care enough about others around us that we will take the time to use our voice to advocate for change. Not every issue is one that's going to affect every single one of us, but by voting and by taking the time to be informed and learn, we are recognizing that who gets elected to a particular office is going to affect policies and laws that affect lots of people in society. Even if they're not all directly going to affect us, they're going to affect people. They're going to affect people's ability to support their families and live comfortably and, and be uh, happy and healthy in our society. And by raising our voice in support of policies and elected officials that bring out those values that we've discussed of compassion and Jivdaya and Seva, we are saying that it's important to us that our society looks like that. Um, I just want to throw out two specific actions in addition to uh, actually voting. Um, and then I have some quick information on, on um, deadlines and registration and things like that. And then I'm, I'm just about done. Um, one thing that you can do if you are, uh, able to and you feel safe doing it is, is, to, uh, is to work as a, a poll worker. Um, so um, these are the people who are actually at the polling stations on election days and during early voting. And because um, many, usually many of the people who work as poll workers are older citizens um, who this year might not feel safe um, doing so because of uh, COVID, um, there is a shortage of poll workers in, in North Carolina. And this is a really, really important function because not having enough poll workers means that the polls run slowly. It means that it there are lines. It means that it's it makes it more difficult for people to vote. Um, so being a poll worker is actually something that really has uh, a compounding effect on everyone being able to exercise this franchise. Um, I understand that not everyone here might be a citizen. Um, and if you are not, um, 
there are ways that you can still do phone banking or um, text messages or things like that for um, particular candidates in your local communities or nationally if you support. Um, and, and as I said, you can still help the people around you make a voting plan. You can still ask your friends and your family about their plans for voting, even if it's not something that you can do particularly, because those conversations matter a lot. Um, so again, uh, just a few things in terms of procedure in North Carolina, in case you weren't aware of them. Um, anyone in North Carolina this year can get an absentee ballot. You don't have to have a reason. And that is basically a paper ballot that will come to your house and you fill it out um, right there. So you don't have to go to a polling place if you don't want to. Um, you can register online. Um, and it will get sent to you. Uh, there's three ways you can return an absentee ballot. You can mail it back with the envelope that they provide you. You can give it in in person at your county board of elections office um, or at any early voting place. So even if you don't want to be at a polling site, you know, you don't want to spend a lot of time there because you don't want to be around too many other people. You can go to an early polling place and just give them the ballot that you've already filled out at home. Um, and the North Carolina State Board of Elections has a lot of really great tools for checking whether your voter registration is active, um, checking if you requested an absentee ballot, where is it, has it gotten to you yet or not, and, and that sort of a thing. Um, if you're not registered to vote yet, the deadline is October 9th. Um, you don't have to turn in an absentee by then or anything like that, but if you're not registered, you have to register by October 9th. Um, and in general, the guidance is really to vote as early as you can and as quickly as you can to decrease the load on the Postal Service and to decrease the load on elections officials because a lot of people are going to be voting by mail this year. Um, I just want to close with a quote from um, Justice Ginsburg, who is a uh, Supreme Court justice and someone who is really a pioneer for, for women in the law who, who passed away um, on, on Friday um, after uh, battling cancer for, for quite a long time um, and, and working in ways that I, I don't know if I, I would be able to do if I, if I you know, was was ill in that way. Um, this is something that she said when she gave a speech once, you know, if you're going to be a lawyer and just practice your profession, you have a skill, but if you want to be a true professional, you will do something outside yourself, sometimes something that makes life a little better for people less fortunate than you. I think this relates back to the earlier point that I made about, do we think about our practice of Jainism as being about our actions? Or about our bhav, you know, if it's if it's just a, a practice of actions, we can all do puja, we can do chaitvanan, we can do uh, fasting and and all of those things. But if we really think about the bhav that should be driving those things and what other actions that results in, I think that that for me at least makes me think that I should be doing things to make life a little better for others. And this is one of the ways, and this topic is, is one of the ways that I, I hope that I can, can try to do that. So the last thing I want to close with is just to get uh, some, I, I lied, I said the other one was my last survey, it's this one, I apologize. Um, if if uh, you're willing to share one action item that you want to take after today, it could be something that you want to learn more about or read more about. It could be a conversation that you want to have. It could be requesting your absentee ballot. Um, what is one action item that you want to take after after discussing this issue? It could be an action item that you want us to take as a community that you want JSENT to to take, um, and that that would be great too. Um, but while these are, are getting filled out, I will also, of course, say, um, again, I'm, I'm not a scholar, I'm not an expert, I'm someone who has been really lucky to, to have a community like you that has helped me learn about Jainism and understand what these issues mean together. Um, I'm really lucky to have had access to such great educational opportunities and to learn more and to be able to educate myself on these issues. So I, I appreciate the, the platform. I appreciate you taking some time to think about what I've said. And if I've said anything that seemed wrong or, or hurtful or offensive, please uh, know that I ask your forgiveness. And I, I hope that we can, can continue this conversation as a community uh, moving forward.
Thank you, Itali. First of all, what an excellent presentation. Great job. I've seen you having your and expressing, I think, your strong opinions in different areas. Uh, as I as I read some of your tweets silently as well. So I like the way you express those. Uh, to members, one important disclaimer here, uh, especially looking at the comments in the chat window, this session is not intended to take Hitali's thought or presentation as is and implement right away or make that as your thought process immediately. But the broader idea is to trigger deep thinking on this direction, improve our learning based on what the information she shared and then do what you feel right about this. So coming back to Itali, I must say, please continue doing this great work. We really appreciate your time and research around this. And as I, I think, you know, a lot of people agree with me that, you know, it takes a lot of courage to come and, you know, talk about this topic. So thank you so much. Let's have a big round of applause for Itali. So coming back to uh, Anshi, I know Anshi, we missed you uh, before, you know, Vitali's presentation. So can you share your screen now? And if you can talk about uh, your presentation. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, JG Nanda, my name is Anchi Karvari, and my parents are Asmita and Kaira Karvari, and I am thankful to have this opportunity to present my ingredient projects, which is on the topic of skincare products. Introduction. All people on Earth like to keep themselves clean. In ancient times, we would wash ourselves with water and then be done with it. But now in the modern world, we have soaps, bubble bath, sunscreen, hand sanitizers, lotions, etc. But can we really trust them? And how do we know if they have animal products or not? As Jane's, one of the three principles and most remembered is ahimsa. We all know what ahimsa means, and it means to not hurt any living being. And as humans, we can't go completely nonviolent, but we can avoid using animal products. Today, I'll be naming some common brands of skincare and telling you if their products are cruelty-free and or vegan. I'll also be naming a few ingredients in skincare products, mainly moisturizers. So here are a few brands that I researched. So Dove. Since 2019, Dove has stopped using testing. So Dove has stopped testing their items on animals. If you want a product that's cruelty-free, meaning they don't test their products on animals, look for the cruelty-free label on it. The label is the picture on the top right above the Dove soap. Dove does not, Dove still uses animal products in their line, so I cannot label them vegan at the time. Neutrogena. Neutrogena does not use animal products, but they haven't stopped testing on animals and will only do so if required by the government or law. According to the Humane Society, animal testing consists of the following. Several tests are commonly performed that expose mice, rats, rabbits, and guinea pigs to cosmetic ingredients. These can include skin, skin and eye irritation tests, where chemicals are rubbed onto the shaved skin or dripped into the eyes of restrained rabbits without any pain relief. There are more than 40 countries that have banned or restricted animal testing for cosmetics. Countries such as Ukraine, Russia, Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Canada, Brazil, and Japan are in the process of phasing out testing on animals. However, the US, the US is not one of those 40 countries yet. Um, it has not banned animal testing. Nivea, for their soap, it's not ideal to buy because it includes animal products like sodium talloate and lanolin alcohol, which I'll explain further in the slides. Lotion, their lotion isn't cruelty free because it applies their lotion on animals to test. So even when Nivea boasts that they use a wide variety of mainly synthetic or plant-based ingredients in their products, they cannot label it as vegan. Uh, next slide, please. 
So here are some ingredients to look out for in skincare products. Lanolin. Our first ingredient is lanolin. It's made from sheep's wool. It's in the and it's a common ingredient in moisturizers. It's using to it's used to soften and moisturize. And some better alternatives to lanolin are plant oils and butter. If you would like to go completely vegan, you can also use coconut oil and olive oil instead. Squalene. Squalene is made from shark liver oil. It's used for anti-aging. A better option is vegan squalene made from olives and wheat germ. Our third ingredient is stearic acid. It's made from pig's stomachs, and it can also be made from cows' and sheep's stomachs as well. Stearic acid is used in moisturizers and soap, and a vegan alternative, is, which is also called stearic acid, can be derived from plant fats. Collagen is used in lots of anti-aging products. It's used in moisturizers, and that makes sense because a lot of moisturizers claim to stop aging. Um, this protein is derived from animal tissue, bone, skin, or ligaments, and it's often from cows. Plant-based alternatives include soya protein and almond oil. Elastin. Elastin is used in the same kind of products as collagen. It's extracted from the muscles, ligaments, and aortas of animals. Vegan alternatives include hyaluronic acid and MSM. Here are a few brands that are cruelty-free. Earthbody, Afterglow Cosmetics, The Soap Market, which is also vegan, and Soapbox Soaps. Um, looking at the cruelty-free symbol, the cruelty-free symbol is the one on the top, and the label for cruelty-free and vegan is at the bottom. There are more brands that are cruelty-free and vegan, but you should you could do your own research on what you would on what you would based on what you want to use. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Anshi. Thank you for sharing that information. It was really helpful. Uh, coming to the next section for the meeting. Uh, it's Wait, we just might, um, before we go on to the next topic, does yes. anybody have any questions for Anshi? Oh, yeah. yeah. Anshi, some of the products you it's said that the- Great presentation, Anshi. Um, you said that there's a, a vegan version and a non-vegan version. And sorry, sorry to interrupt. Same. I just want to give her a chance to respond. Oh, oh sure. Sorry. Okay. Um, could you please repeat what you said? I think that, go, ahead, go ahead quickly, uh, Hitali. I think Purvi didn't realize you were asking a question. Yeah, some of the stuff you said that there's a vegan version and a non-vegan version, and sometimes they have the same name. Do you like, like if you go on the company's websites, do they usually say which one they use? Like, how do you think we should figure out if it just says stearic acid? Like, how should we figure out which kind of stearic acid it is? I think um, if you look at some of the other um, other ingredients, and then so if they have mostly vegan materials, you can infer that like. That might be vegan as well, but um, if it has like other ingredients made from animal products, then you can probably infer that that's probably that's made from an, an animal product as well. Cool, thanks. I, I I think it is basically the labels that you are showing, Anshi, right? That the labels they mostly label their product accordingly, so you can go by the label. This is Artisha. Uh, sometimes it's a very easy to find a store like a Big Lots. And in Crossroad <coughs> Shopping Center, there is a store called Home Centric. The most of the things I buy from there, <coughs> and they have a symbol, they put uh, cruelty free or there's a vegan, a uh, hand soap, 
and moisturizer and so there are so many other things like a shampoo conditioner stuff like that and we all know in our society sudhir bhai shah he makes all the skin products anything what he makes is always 100% not only chemicals free but cruelty free also so if you want to contact sudhir bhai uh, our directory has number also and i do have the number also and uh, there are so many things are available like johnson's aubrey hampton kiss my face the hundreds of um, uh, companies they have started making it even the trader joe's if you go for shopping like a toothpaste they have a 100% cruelty free toothpaste also and of course soap uh, face wash facial scrub different stuff like that and uh, there is a brand called karks karks makes a cruelty free and the other brand called uh, simple pleasure that's a hand soap that we always you know keep in the bathroom so these soaps are also cruelty free so you can do more research online and you will find so many options thank okay you. thank you thank you for the information mm -hmm. yeah thank you Arthi. so when we actually uh, publish the presentations we can add those items to the resources thank you Thank you, Arthiven. Thank you, Anshi. Thank you for sharing those information. I think somebody is not on mute. I see some. Uh, I hear some echo. All right. All right. So moving to the next section, uh, that is announcement section. So we have less but very important announcements. So first is a Chromebook project. I'm very happy to announce that Chromebook project is successfully executed. Fifty Chromebooks are delivered. To Washington GT Magnet Elementary School. Uh, school, is with, uh, school is busy with cataloging them in for the next few weeks. And uh, I have received thank you email from school principal for generosity and support for the support of the Jain Society. And I wish to express my deepest appreciation to all who participated in this cause. Thank you so much for your all, uh, all your support. Uh, moving to the next announcement, traditionally, when we reach end of September like this, right, we are busy in, you know, setting up the camp Lalith and preparation around that. But considering COVID-19 this year, uh, this year is a little different. So after discussing with Kamlesh Bhai, committee has called off camp event. Uh, we think it is not uh, practical to have even virtual camp. It will be a little, uh, little difficult. So let's do it when COVID is not around. Uh, we'll do it with, you know, bang next year. Uh, next is about East Souvenir project. East Souvenir committee is working on reviewing major articles. Uh, there is still good amount of work remaining, but yes, we'll get there. We have, we, we are trying to finish as soon as possible. Uh, and the next announcement is about upcoming discourses for next few months. So today's discourse, I see, you know, it is well received. I see, uh, I mean, uh, in between Marapat Gusbam Sura, I get, and I see a lot of comments in the chat window. People are, people were so much engaged. So considering that for next few months, you know, if you think there are multitude of things we care about every day, but during this difficult time, if we think what is most important, then most of us will answer that, you know, probably mental health. So we came across one of the scholars, uh, she's from India, who is a spiritual trainer and medi meditation coach. Uh, her name is Deepika Gala. Uh, I'll share her, you know, brief biodata and uh, more information about her in coming emails. Uh, but we have invited her for October discourse. So let's hope that works all for all of us and we'll get more information around that. So don't miss that. Uh, then for November, uh, that's the Diwali time. So I don't want to say much about that, but, uh, you know, because it's still under discussion, but we are trying to, you know, do something special uh, for Diwali. Uh, but one thing I can say is, you know, it will be one of a kind of uh, for JSC and see if that happens. So keep uh, looking emails and updates and newsletters for more information around that. Uh, that's all with respect to announcement. Uh, now, the last part is Uva Sagram. So as I mentioned at the beginning of meeting, uh, 
we have set up something special. So let me share my screen. <coughs> I'm sharing one more time. So this is uh, basically the video shared by Arvind Bhai. Uvasagram, Emna Gardera Sarmadi. So I think, you know, every member can, at least Bhagwan Darshan does it. And I'll play Uvasagram right now. Hitesh, you're not sharing right now. Yeah, I'm sharing in a minute. Yeah. Can you see? Yes. Okay. Just a second, I don't see that far. Video. Okay, let me play from here. Vasagaram pasam pasam vannami kamadaram Visara visa ninnasam Mangala kalyane avasam Mangala kalyane avasam Visara pulinga mantam Kante dare Josaya Manu Tasagarogamari Dutta Jarajan Tiosam Dutta Jarajan Tiosam Chitto do de Manto Tuja Palamo Bivaloi Narthiri Esu Vijiva Pavantina Dukadoga Jam Pavantina Dukadoga Jam Tu Samate Labde Chindamani Kappapaya Vapayi Pavantiya Vikyanam Jeeva Ayramaram Thanam Jeeva Ayramaram Thanam Yasantuo Mayasa Bhakti Bani Bharanahi Tadeva Dichyavoyim Bhave Bhave Pasijin Chand Bhave Bhave Pasijin Chand All right, so thank you, Arvind Bhai, for sending this wonderful video. More importantly, I think, you know, as I mentioned, Tarik member Nai Prabhu Na Darshan Thai Atyare and Vises Kainik. So thank you so much. So with that, uh, we reached to the end of the monthly meeting. Uh, thanks for joining. Please be safe and good in health. Uh, Arshad Bhai. Jai Bolai Dodo Bhaji. Thank you so much. Harshad Bhai is showing a picture of Hetamli that she keeps, <laughs> she keeps uh, that picture on his fridge, his refrigerator. Oh, very nice, very nice. <laughs> so he is showing it to everyone. Harshad Bhai, Harshad Bhai, Jai Bolai Dodo Bhaji. Bolai Dodo Bhaji. Harshad, I guess. Yeah, Harshad, I audio for nothing.